I love to how you explain very clearly, you make it clear that parent blaming is inappropriate, inaccurate, and unscientific. You also say yeah. that it's cruel in the book. And you also say that you don't support unwarranted self-accusation. Yeah. So, because we're so quick to go, oh, well, my mother did this or my father or they were absent. Or then we're quick to say if there's an illness, because you speak so much about the mind body, which I'm excited to talk to you about. Mm. But we, we can then go, well, I did this to myself. Like I've, I've messed up my health. I've, I mean, I, I, I want to just make that clear up front because I think that sometimes people think like there's shame attached to these conversations or that someone's done something really un, like uh, unkind or something bad. But this is just, it's, it's just reality. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about blaming. Uh, my mm -hmm. first book uh, was on attention deficit disorder mm -hmm. when I was diagnosed with it in my mid fifties. And mm -hmm. I never bought into the idea that it's a genetic brain disease. I, you know, mm -hmm. so I wrote my book and I explained that my own infancy under the Nazis, Jewish parents, my mother was really stressed and she could barely assure my physical survival. She certainly had very little time for my emotional needs, mm -hmm. given the terrible circumstances of living under the Nazis in Hungary in 1944. And I said in the book, that I'm telling the story to indicate how, and, and, and my whole point is that when the mother is stressed, the baby's stressed and the baby deals with the stress by tuning out, it's a protective mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that protective mechanism of tuning out gets programmed into the brain. So we're not dealing with a, 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 a genetic disease here. We de we effect, we're dealing with the effect of the environment on the child's brain development. That's my whole mm -hmm. point. Anyway, said in the book right there in Scattered Minds, that's the title of the book just been republished in the States this month, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I say that I tell the story to indicate how the greatest love a mother may have may not be enough to protect the children from her stresses. Mm -hmm. Now, the Toronto Star, a Canadian newspaper, reviewed the book and said, Mate blames his mother. Mm -hmm. And I went to my mom. She was still alive. And I said, hey, mom, the Toronto Star says that you started the Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> And my, mother, oh my. and my mother said, sure, <laughs> sure I did, you know. <laughs> wow. So, but but it, it just, people mm -hmm. see blame and there isn't any. So mm -hmm. it's a fine line. It, the fact is that the human personality and physiologically the human brain, according to all the science, develop an interaction with the environment beginning in utero. And that also means that when mothers are stressed, those stresses get translated into physiological effects and psychological effects in the infant already in utero. So no one, that's just, that's just reality. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you're blaming the mother. No, you're not. Which mother chooses to be stressed? Mm -hmm. Did my mother choose to be, uh, uh, choose the second world war? Mm -hmm. You know, does, does any, does it, did your mother, choose to be stressed mm -mm. or was she following the dynamics dictated by her own traumatic imprints as a child mm -hmm. yeah my she... mom grew up yeah my mom grew up in post-war poland 1942 it was with nothing it was yeah. it was horrible like whatever we lived i know that she had something yeah far more extreme so so yeah. so on the one hand we have to recognize so to recognize now me as a parent I have three adult kids. Mm -hmm. I passed my trauma onto my, I talk about this in the book, the myth of normal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I passed my trauma onto my kids. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Through my workaholism, through my other addictive behaviors, through the significant stresses that my wife and I were faced with in our own relationship. Mm -hmm. So our kids are kind of grew up in a emotional war zone sometimes. And sometimes it was very playful and loving and light and, you know, delightful, but they never knew when the next storm was going to come. And that mm -hmm. affected their development. Now that's just the truth. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. Am I blaming myself? Well, I used to, mm -hmm. but I don't because I didn't deliberately do it. I was no. acting out my own programming. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing is to recognize the truth without blame. And, and you know what? I've often said to my kids, I'm not worried that you'll be angry with me. I'm worried that you won't be angry enough. 
So I want them to feel their anger, but that's not the same as blaming. Because blaming says you did something deliberately and knowingly. Mm. Anger says, I don't like what you did. Mm. And speaking of anger, you speak about you know anger in the book and how we've lost a lot of anger. I think women especially, and then you we kind of touched on this slightly, but how women who are very nice, you know, um, nothing for me, don't worry about me. Even yeah. share a story about a lady who, when she was diagnosed with cancer, she's like, oh, what was my husband going to do? Like that was her first question. Well, what, well, here's what happened. So she was, this is an article in a Canadian newspaper. This woman um, is describing her experience first person. Mm-hmm. And her husband's first, her, her name is, Donna, I think her husband's name is High, and High's first wife died of breast cancer, and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with breast cancer. And the doctor says to her, "Don't worry, it was not like that of High's first wife. She, her cancer spread had spread everywhere by the time they found it. In your case, it hasn't spread. You're not going to die." And Donna says, "But I'm worried about High." I'm afraid I won't have the strength to support him. So here she is diagnosed with a condition. The doctor can't, in all honesty, tell her. Because we just don't know. But she's the one that, regardless of the prognosis, will have to have surgery, maybe radiation, maybe um, um, chemotherapy. And her first thought is, but how will I support my husband? rather than, oh boy, what, 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 what am I going to need here? So this automatic regard for the emotional needs of others, suppressing your own, is a characteristic of people that I've found and other researchers found is present in many cases of malignancy and many cases of autoimmune disease. And we can talk about the mind-body unity, how these mm-hmm. traits actually affect the physiology. <clears throat> now, um, who in this, no, the, another characteristic is, is that people who are very nice are very often people who can't get in touch with their healthy anger. Yes. No. Healthy anger is, you cross my boundaries, get out. That's healthy anger. It's in a moment. It's, it's a healthy dynamic. It, our brains are wired for it. It's a protection. Mm-hmm. It's a boundary defense. I'm not mm-hmm. talking about rage and destructive acting out on others. I'm talking about healthy anger that says, you're in my space, get out. Mm-hmm. That's true emotionally or physically. Mm-hmm. Or even, if I may say, when your husband says, get up, mm-hmm. you say, don't talk to me that way. Mm-hmm. That's just healthy anger. Mm-hmm. Now, who in this society is programmed by the culture to repress their healthy anger and to look after the emotional needs of others and be always be nice? It's women. Mm-hmm. And it's not biological. It's not gendered. It's, it's not determined by biological gender. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's, it's cultural. Mm-hmm. And that's why women have 80% of autoimmune disease. And it also means that if you look at autoimmune disease or malignancy or whatever, if you deal with these emotional dyna- dynamics, your chances are much better. And that's been shown as well. And there was mm-hmm. a study out of Massachusetts, um, maybe 20 years ago now, 15 years ago, they looked at 10,000 women, no, 2,000 women over a period of 10 years. And those women who are unhappily married and didn't express their emotions were four times as likely to die in that 10 year period the women who are also unhappy married, but did talk about their emotions. Mm-hmm. So the issue wasn't happiness or unhappiness. The issue was, did you express it? Or were you too nice and did you repress it? That was the issue. Because that repression of emotions and anger actually has an impact on the immune system. And it's women in this society who are programmed by the culture to take everybody else's needs and to suppress themselves. Is that part of attachment? So when we speak about authenticity, when you speak about authenticity and attachment and how they yeah. compete, 
Is that part of attachment? Well, yes. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Attachment, the way we are talking about it right now, means mm -hmm. um, the drive to be close to somebody mm -hmm. in order to be taken care of or in order to take care of. So there's mm -hmm. a powerful attachment drive between infants and, and, and parents, mm -hmm. particularly, but not exclusively, between infant and mother. Mm-hmm. Um, ideally, the child will have lots of other attachment figures, the father, the grandmother, the grandfather, your cousins, uncles, aunts, you know. That's how we evolved as a species, by the way. We didn't evolve in isolated nuclear families. So attachment is this drive for connection. Attachment is like a force of gravity. It pulls two bodies together. It's essential for survival, for birds, for all mammals, and certainly for human beings. I mean, if a child doesn't have an attachment drive, or if the parent doesn't, what happens to the child? There's no survival. Mm -hmm. So that need is there. And and it's with us all our lives. I mean, in order to procreate, we have to have an attachment instinct. In order to, be, to, to care for each other as adults, it's attachment, it's connection. It's powerful in human life. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a need that we have. But we have another need as well, which is what you've named, and it's authenticity. Authenticity, out of the self, being in touch with ourselves, and being able to express who we are and to be able to stand in who we are. Now, why is that important? Well, gut feelings, for example. That's being in connection with ourselves. That's being authentic, is to know and be able to act on our gut feelings. Now, any creature in nature... How long do they live if they're not in touch with their gut feelings? Not very long. So we have this need to be authentic and we have need to attach. But what happens is if you as a child or I as a child or anybody as a child gets the message that if you're in touch with your feelings and you express them, we don't like you. We can't handle it. It's not acceptable. You sit in a corner if you're angry. You sit by yourself. Well, what message does the child get? The message the child gets is, I, who I am, is not acceptable. If I want to attach, I have to suppress who I am. It's not a conscious decision. We can't help it. It's an automatic survival mechanism because the attachment has to be maintained. And if I have to become less than myself and suppress myself in order to attach, to belong, to be accepted, I will do that. But once we do it, we get out of contact with who we are and we spend the rest of our lives not, not, not authentic. We, we tend to comply, to accept other people's opinion about ourselves. We tend to want to fit in, to be accepted, to be nice, to conform, to belong. And we do this in our relationships. Mm-hmm. In our marriages, we do this mm -hmm. at work. And it's almost like we're living the life of somebody else. Until some crisis happens. Yeah. A divorce, a relationship breakup, or repeated ones, or friendships that don't work, or a sense of alienation that we just, I don't feel like I am who I am. Who am I anyway? Or some illness depression, anxiety, and addiction, or an autoimmune disease, or a flare-up, or frequent colds, or headaches, or migraines, or frequent back pains, whatever. And then we say, well, what's going on here? So something has to happen to wake us up. And then we start saying, well, okay, how can I find out who I really am? You know, so that the mm -hmm. joy and the happiness that is my birthright is actually accessible to me. Because right now it isn't. 